I'm Mark Kelty, uh, Director of Theater, and uh, thank you very much for joining us today at the, uh, the first leg of our Tennessee Williams Festival. We have a number of events taking place over the course of the next nine days, and I hope you can make, make it out to many of them, uh, beginning today with uh, Brett Johnson, who will be uh, talking to us, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about Brett in a second. Tonight and tomorrow night, the Glass Menagerie is playing at the Assembly Hall, which is um, on campus beneath the Lynn Memorial Church, directed by Professor Geist, who is right here in our presence. 7.30 tonight and tomorrow night, and Sunday at 2 o'clock. We have a movie here Sunday night, uh, the Night of the Iguana, and a movie next Wednesday, Cat on a Hot Tin Roof. Those are both at 7 o'clock. And then uh, next Thursday through Sunday, uh, A Streetcar Named Desire in the Little Theater. Uh, so I hope you can make it out to uh, some of those events. They should be really great. Uh, we're, you know, we're really honored to have uh, Brett Johnson here. Um, he has become an expert on Tennessee Williams. And um, he is also one of our adjunct professors. He teaches... Uh, at the Columbia campus and is wildly popular there as he is at MU where he is working on his uh, PhD in theater and will be Dr. Johnson in uh, just a couple of months. Uh, he's then headed off to Mercyhurst University in Erie, Pennsylvania, his home state, and uh, we in this area are going to be very sorry to lose him and to see him go. Um, I've had the great, very great fortune to act with Brett, and I've seen him act in other things. He is uh, extremely talented. And also, um, if any of you were lucky enough to see Brett's um, production that he directed of Twelfth Night, it was a special treat, I tell you. you know, Charlie Chaplin and people like that somehow appeared in a Shakespearean play. But he's a director in the true sense in that he brought his vision to it, uh, which enhanced the meaning of the play, and it was visually uh, spectacular as well as very entertaining, as, uh, as we always hope that Twelfth Night will be. He holds a BA in theater from Susquehanna University and an MA in theater from the University of Missouri. He is currently a doctoral uh, candidate in theater at MU and will graduate in May. His uh, primary research interests include Tennessee Williams, musical theater, historiography, and acting pedagogy. Brett is the recipient of the Donald K. Anderson Graduate Teaching Award, a Huggins Fellowship, a University Fellowship, and a Chancellor's Excellence Award for Graduate Student Leadership. His scholarship has appeared in such publications as Theater Journal, Ecumenica, The Player's Journal, and The Grove Dictionary of American Music. Let's have a big hand for soon to be Dr. Thank you, Mark. Good morning, everyone, or good afternoon, I guess. Uh, I'm so happy to be here and talk to you about Tennessee Williams. Uh, what I'm going to do uh, this afternoon for the next 45 minutes or so is give you just an overview, as superficial as that may be, of Williams' life and career, highlighting uh, some of my favorites. All right, so Williams was born in 1911 in Columbus, Mississippi, and this is his birthplace and you can go visit it, you see the little plaque commemorating the site. In 1911, to Cornelius Coffin Williams, his father was a traveling salesman, and his mother, Edwina Dakin uh, Williams, was the daughter of uh, a, an Episcopalian minister. All right? And so, uh, when Williams was, what, five years old, the family moved to Clarksdale, uh, where they lived at the parsonage with uh, his maternal grandparents. And he enjoyed this kind of idyllic southern upbringing, he and his older sister Rose, and their imaginations were stimulated by these stories that were told by their uh, nanny, their African-American maid named Ozzy. Um, while they were living in Clarksdale, Williams suffered from diphtheria and actually almost died, and this was the time when he really became invested in books and reading and writing. All right. In 1918, when Williams was seven years old, the family moved to St. Louis because his father, C.C. Williams, got a job as the branch manager of the International Shoe Company. All right. This move was traumatic for 
Tom and his sister Rose. They had enjoyed this idyllic southern upbringing, and then suddenly they moved into this industrialized center. His father was home all the time. He had been out on the road, all right, and this was very much as Lyle Leverick one of Williams' biographers said, a marriage made in hell. <laughs> the father was an alcoholic, he was a womanizer, and he was verbally and physically abusive. And now he and Edwina were living under the same roof. All right. Uh, this is one of the apartments where the Williams family lived in St. Louis. You can still go visit it. And this may have been um, the site for the inspiration of the Glass Menagerie. All right. And in 1919, Two years after their move, or actually one year after their move to St. Louis, Williams' younger brother, Dakin, was born. All right. His earliest commercially uh, published piece entitled, Can a Good Wife Be a Good Sport? was published in Smart Set Magazine in 1927. And then in 1928, he had a sh short story entitled, The Vengeance of Natocris, published in the August issue of Weird Tales Magazine. And this is about the semi-legendary Egyptian pharaoh uh, who was wronged, and then she holds a great banquet in this underground chamber, and in the middle of the meal she leaves and opens the sluice gates and they all drown. And uh, the first line is great. First sentence of the story, hushed were the streets of many people Thebes. So that's the kind of florid language that runs throughout the short story. In 1929, Williams entered the University of Missouri, planning to um, study journalism. These are two of his yearbook pictures from the 1930 Savitar and the 1931 Savitar. Williams scholar Aileen Hale has said this about his time at the university. Quote, his Columbia years were perhaps the most normal of his life. He went jellying and juking at campus joints, attended dances at Christian College, and went on double dates with close friends like Elmer Lower, who usually had to find him the girl. He bought riding breeches and took equitation, which must have seemed more romantic than phys ed. At the time he was constantly observing his classmates, he became an ATO brother, and some of the names of the people that he met at MU worked their way into his stories. You might recognize uh, the names Goforth, Venable, Harold Mitchell, or Mitch, in a streetcar named Desire, and Pollitt. Usually he gave them different physical attributes, but one of them, Jim Connor, a handsome Irishman from St. Louis, became the actual prototype of the gentleman caller in the Glass Menagerie. In 1930, Williams uh, wrote his first play, entitled Beauty is the Word, and he entered it into the annual Dramatics Art Club One Act Play Contest. The play was not performed, but it was reviewed by the student newspaper. And this was really, this is important not only because it's Williams' first play, but also because it was his first attack on Puritanism, all right, and its persecution of the artist, and incidentally upon his own religious upbringing. In 1931, he entered another play entitled Hot Milk at Three in the Morning, and this is a letter that he wrote home to his mother. Dear mother, I'm enclosing the program of the one-act play contest. I did not have time to finish the play that I was working on during the holidays, which I think might have won the contest. But I turned in a considerably shorter and lighter manuscript, a domestic satire titled Hot Milk at Three in the Morning, which was given honorable mention with the criticism that it contained no stage diagram and that the speeches were too long. <laughs> with much love, Tom. Uh, this one act one honorable mention, and it's notable for its similarity to Eugene O'Neill. Williams is really trying to imitate uh, America's really first playwright, Eugene O'Neill. Uh, more specifically, one of his one acts called Before Breakfast. All right, And the subject, which is interesting, is of a man trapped in a marriage with his home becoming a veritable <coughs> prison. Hmm. That sounds familiar. So Williams was really thinking about the, these ideas of entrapment and escape very early in his career. Think about the way that he and his family were trapped in this apartment in St. Louis. And many people, Williams included, think that if he didn't have his writing, right, that release, then he may have suffered the same fate as his sister Rose, which I'll talk about in a little bit. I forgot to mention this, but when he was working at the International Shoe Company in St. Louis, um, well, I'll get to that in a minute. I don't want to get ahead of myself. All right. Um, he's forced to leave the university by his father, 
<laughs> because his grades were mediocre, but kind of the final nail in the coffin was that he got an F in ROTC. And so his father forced him to withdraw and move back to St. Louis where he worked at the International Shoe Company. He would work there all day, and then he would stay up all night smoking cigarettes and drinking coffee and writing. And his family would hear the click, 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 click of the typewriter, and every once in a while he would rip out a page and rip it up and throw it away, and click, 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 click all night long. All right? Um, it was during this time in St. Louis when he had his first play performed, and it was entitled Cairo, Shanghai, Bombay by the Garden Players. Um, in 1936, he enrolled at Washington University as a non-degree seeking student. This is the T.S. Eliot Club at Washington University, and there's Williams in the front row on the left. He did not graduate from Washington University. Uh, he also had two leftist plays, Candles in the Sun and Fugitive Kind, performed by the Mummers in St. Louis. In 1938, finally, he graduated from the University of Iowa with a BA in English. And he wrote a play called Not About Nightingales, which is based on a real event, a prison riot that happened in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Williams wrote this in 1938, but it wasn't produced until 1998. Vanessa Redgrave, famous British actress, was looking in the Williams archives and came across this manuscript. And eventually, uh, it was produced in the West End and then on Broadway. In 1939, he adopted, this is kind of a watershed year for Williams. He adopted the pen name Tennessee. Now, throughout his life, he gave several reasons as to why he took this pseudonym. The most frequent reason is that it was for uh, the state where his father's ancestors had, had settled. All right. Um, so he became Tennessee Williams. This was also the year when he entered a playwriting competition through the group theater and won. He won a hundred dollar prize, but it was only for writers under the age of 25. And so Williams changed his birth date from 1911 to 1914 and submitted this collection of One Axe American Blues under the name Tennessee Williams. This is also the year when he met his longtime agent, Audrey Wood. Here's a letter that he, oh, maybe not. There we go. Here's a letter that he sent to her. Um, about myself, I'm, a 25, I'm 25, a native of Mississippi, descendant of Indian fighting Tennessee pioneers. I've attended three universities, getting my BA degree last summer from the University of Iowa. While there, I worked as a waiter in the state hospital. Waiting tables is my chief subsidiary occupation, although I've also been employed in a shoe warehouse. I've had two long plays presented in St. Louis by the mummers of that city. Of course, I started out being very conceited about my work, but that was rapidly kicked out of me. Now I think I have a fairly complete humility. Thanks for giving me this delightful opportunity to talk about myself sincerely, Tennessee Williams. And Audrey Wood was his agent and his close friend for 32 years. Um, they had a falling out during rehearsals for one of his plays, and he railed on her, and, and he could just tear someone down um, with his words, and that's what he did. And that ended their friendship, that ended their association, and he had several more agents before he died. All right, Audrey Wood is a very, very important figure in Tennessee Williams' life and career. Uh, in 1938, Williams spent his first sojourn in New Orleans, and he said in his notebook dated Wednesday, December 28th, a few days after he had arrived, here surely is the place that I was made for, if any place, on this funny old world. And then in a short story, one of my favorites, entitled The Angel on the Alcove, he wrote, each time I have felt some rather profound psychic wound, a loss or a failure, I have returned to this city. At such periods, I would seem to belong there and no place else in the country. He really considered New Orleans his spiritual home. And this is a picture of 722 Toulouse Street in New Orleans, where he stayed in Mrs. Anderson's boarding house. And there was a very um, infamous episode at the boarding house one night when there was a party going on uh, in the basement. And um, Mrs. Anderson took a, supposedly took, uh, a pot of boiling water off the stove and poured it through the cracks in the floor onto the guests in the party. Mm -hmm. So, In 
In 1940, Williams had his first professional production, which premiered in Boston, and it was entitled Battle of Angels. It wasn't published until 1945 in a magazine called Pharos uh, through New Directions, and this was actually, they only had two issues of this particular magazine. And this is very much a play about uh, sexual repression, and again, going back to these ideas of entrapment and escape. Here, you might find this interesting. Uh, with, along with the script that was published in Pharaoh's magazine, Williams wrote an essay called The History of a Play with Parentheses. Listen to his description of opening night. Opening night. Things started rolling peacefully enough. The elegant first night audience entered the theater with an air of nobility and refinement, which boded little of what to, was to come in our next three hours of communion with them. They looked on the first scenes with bland satisfaction, gowned by Bergdorf Goodman, Miss Miriam Hopkins was as radiantly beautiful as any of our debutante daughters. The character women upset the dowagers a little bit from time to time, but the general attitude toward the earthly humor they brought to the script was still indulgent. It was not until the action concerning V's visionary portrait of Val, um, uh, a woman who is married to the sheriff in the town, V Talbot, paints these uh, visions that she has, and she has a vision of Val, this itinerant musician who comes to town, and she depicts him as Christ all right, in this painting. Needless to say, it upsets everyone in this very sexually repressed town. Uh, that the peculiar attitude which this audience brought to the theater began to make itself seen, heard, and felt. Up and down the aisles, the ladies and gentlemen began to converse with one another in sibilant whispers. Subdued <coughs> hissings and cluckings were punctuated now and then by the banging up of a seat and the regal swish of silken garments drawn hurriedly over <coughs> projecting knees as here and there it became impossible for some spectator to countenance further infractions of standards. Here's my favorite part. Okay, so there's a fire toward the end of the play. It was not until the point of the conflagration that the Boston audience was in a strategic position to vent its full displeasure. At the final dress rehearsal, there had not been enough smoke to make the fire convincing. Obviously, this deficiency had been thoroughly impressed upon the gentlemen operating the smoke pots. For on opening night, when it came time for the, sto the store to burn down, it was like the burning of Rome. Great sulfurous billows rolled chokingly onto the stage and coiled over the footlights. To an already antagonistic audience, this was sufficient to excite something in the way of pandemonium. Outrage, squawks, gabbling, spluttering spread through the front rows of the theater. Nothing had happened on the stage from then on that was of any importance. When the curtain at last came down, as curtains eventually must, I had come to the point where one must either laugh or go crazy. I laughed. It was dismissed by Boston audiences and critics and never made it to Broadway, but Williams continued to retool the script. Eventually it became Orpheus Descending, and then it was turned into a film version called Fugitive Kind with Marlon Brando and Anna Mignani. In fact, I think a year or two ago, Criterion Collection uh, released Fugitive Kind, directed by Sidney Lumet. It's quite good. I encourage you to check it out. In 1943, uh, Williams' sister Rose, with whom he was very close, underwent a bilateral prefrontal lobotomy. Williams was away at the time. He was working as a screenwriter for MGM. And this event was very, very traumatic to Williams. He felt responsible for this happening. His mother had okayed the surgery while he was away. And just to give you a sense, in his notebook on the 24th, he said, Grand, his grandmother, God be with you, a cold <coughs> breaking a thousand miles away, rose, her head cut open, a knife thrust into her brain, me, here, smoking. My father, mean as a devil, snoring, a thousand miles away. And he also wrote a poem, it gently comes and gently goes, the whisper of my sister rose, and my voice with her drops low, our eyes remember each to each, a time of purity I've lost, but that she's kept at dreadful cost. By today's standards, we would probably diagnose Rose as schizophrenic. And she had the, underwent the lobotomy. And later, when asked how she was, Williams would always say, well, she's passive. She's quiet. Rose appears again and again in Williams' poetry, in his short stories, in his essays, in his plays. 
I'll talk more about that in a little bit. In fact, uh, a screenplay that he was working on at the time called The Gentleman Caller featured a character that was very similar to Rose in many ways. Uh, Williams eventually reworked this material into The Glass Menagerie, which premiered in Chicago on the 26th of December, 1944. There were two Chicago critics who championed this play. It was the middle of a blizzard, not many people were going, and then Ashton Stevens and Claudia Cassidy were just raving about the production night after night in the newspapers. The Glass Menagerie eventually opened on Broadway on the 31st of March and won the New York Drama Critics Circle uh, Award. Excuse me. Now, this is really the play that skyrocketed Williams to some kind of acclaim. All right. It's important for many reasons, but one thing that I would like to mention is that Tennessee Williams disregarded realistic theater at the time when that was the dominant style on the American stages. This is, a, I love this, Al Hirschfeld drawing which appeared in the New York Times on March 25th, 1945, six days before the Broadway opening. So on the left, we have the Grand Dame of Broadway, Catherine Cornell, playing Elizabeth, Bar Elizabeth Barrett Browning. On the right, we have a new poet to give the Brownings a run for their, uh, a run for their money. <laughs> So this drawing in many ways summarizes the transition that was happening on the week that the Glass Menagerie appeared on Broadway. On the left, we get a depiction of two costumed stars. Really, the attraction of this play is going to see these actors. So we get these two stars playing a melodrama framed by curtains, obviously a classical theater experience. As the drawing moves to the right, the curtains literally hit a brick wall with a tenement setting in the background. So the glamour of the stage is giving way to the grit of human drama. In his uh, production notes to The Glass Menagerie, Tennessee Williams introduces this idea of a plastic theater. And I'm not going to read this to you, but it basically describes Williams' ideal theater, which makes use of all of the stage's resources. What can the stage do that, for instance, a film can't? Lighting, sound, music, movement, sets, props to generate a theatrical experience that is greater than realism. Williams wanted a truly multi-dimensional theater integrating all of the arts. And in doing so, he's really hearkening back to the etymological meaning of playwright to craft, right, uh, as a constructive workman. He was envisioning a dramatist who rather than just writing scripts, wrought them from all of the materials that were available. All right. So this idea of a plastic theater, we will see Williams uh, playing with and refining and developing throughout his career. Lorette Taylor uh, played Amanda in the original production of The Glass Menagerie. And for those people who saw it, it is supposedly one of the greatest performances ever to grace a Broadway stage. Uh, she had been a famous actor, and then uh, after her husband died, she kind of left the theater, became an alcoholic. And The Glass Menagerie was, in many ways, kind of her final hurrah. And I just want to play for you a few minutes of Williams, Tennessee Williams, reading Tom's opening monologue in The Glass Menagerie. Here's Lorette Taylor. I have tricks in my pocket. I have things up my sleeve. But I am the opposite of a stage magician. He gives you illusion that has the appearance of truth. I give you truth in the pleasant disguise of illusion. I take you back to an alley in St. Louis. The time is that quaint period, the 30s, when the huge middle class of America was matriculating in a school for the blind. Their eyes had failed them, or they had failed their eyes, and they were having their fingers pressed forcibly down on the fiery braille alphabet of a dissolving economy. In Spain, there was revolution. Here, there was only shouting and confusion and labor disturbances, sometimes pretty violent in otherwise peaceful cities, such as Cleveland, Chicago, Detroit, St. Louis. That's the social background of the play. The play is memory. Being a memory play, it is dimly lighted. It is sentimental. It is not realistic. In memory, everything seems to happen to music. 
That explains the fiddle in the wings. Okay. In 1947, a streetcar named Desire premiered at the Ethel Barrymore Theater in New York City and ran for 855 performances. It became the first play, first American play ever to win all three major awards, the Pulitzer Prize, the New York Drama Critics Circle Award, and the Donaldson Award. Nowadays, it's kind of customary to give a standing ovation at the end of any production, right? We all leap to our feet and applaud for the performers. Uh, back in 1947, when A Streetcar Named Desire premiered on Broadway, uh, as, uh, there's this great documentary about Streetcar and, and Williams called Wounded Genius, and they say, back then, people only stood for the national anthem. And at the end of the opening night of A Streetcar Named Desire, supposedly there was a moment of silence, and then the entire audience just leapt to their feet, and this thunderous applause went over the footlights. Why is Streetcar significant? Well, <laughs> many reasons. Uh, the American Theatre Critics Association voted A Streetcar Named Desire the most important American play, more than Eugene O'Neill's Long Day's Journey Into Night, more than Arthur Miller's Death of a Salesman. Why was Streetcar notable for 1947? It shocked audiences. Outside of Eugene O'Neill's work, this was the first American play in which sexuality was patently at the core of the lives of the central characters. Streetcar explores female sexuality, homosexuality, and sexual politics. Here are some superlatives from a 1989 Playwrights Forum. You can see what uh, some of Williams' colleagues said about the importance of a streetcar named Desire. And then, just a few more here for you. This is the play that is most closely identified with Tennessee Williams. In 1996, when they issued a commemorative postage stamp, it was a streetcar named Desire that was associated with the playwrights. Notice we have Williams in the foreground in his typical white suit, and then in the background, we have the streetcar. This testifies to the centrality of streetcar in Williams' canon. In 1947, I'm going to move a little faster because I'm running out of time. He met his longtime lover and companion, Frank Merlot. And uh, Williams was also a prolific poet. I should have mentioned this. He had several volumes of poetry published during his lifetime. And perhaps, if he had never achieved acclaim as a dramatist, he may have made a name for himself as a poet. And I would like to play for you Williams reading a poem that he dedicated to Frank Merlot, who traveled with him, who was his secretary, who was his companion, who really kept his life together for many years. Lost when little horse inquired of me. What has a. Oh, hold on, let me see if I can go back. There we go. Mignon he was, or mignonette, avec les yeux plus grands que lui. My name for him was Little Horse. I fear he had no name for me. I came upon him more by plan than accidents appear to be. Something started or something stopped, and there I was, and there was he. And then it rained, but Little Horse had brought along his parapluie. Petit Cheval had kept quite dry till he divided it with me. For it was late, and I was lost when Little Horse inquired of me. But has a bark but cannot bite, and I was right, it was a tree. Mignon he is, or mignonette, avec les jeux plus grands que lui. My name for him is Little Horse. I wish he had a name for me. In 1953, Tennessee Williams' Camino Reel premiered on Broadway, subtitled A Prayer for the Wild at Heart Kept in Cages. It only lasted 60 performances on Broadway. This is a highly experimental play, pleading for the triumph of the romantic attitude over brutalizing reality. It's one of his most boldly symbolic dramas, and it combines a bunch of familiar literary characters, such as Don Quixote, Marguerite Gautier, and Baron de Charles within a phantasmagoric world. Here's another drawing by Al Hirschfeld uh, for the opening night of Camino Real. And if you're interested, the Goodman Theater next month is producing Camino, and I'm going to go up and see it because you never see a full production 
many, many characters, uh, very uh, demanding technically. All right. In 1955, Cat on a Hot Tin Roof earned Tennessee Williams his second Pulitzer Prize. In 1956, the film Baby Doll was released. I'll talk about this a little more Wednesday night. But Cardinal Spellman condemned it from the pulpit of St. Patrick's Cathedral in New York City as being uh, too sexually licentious. In 1961, Tennessee Williams' The Night of the Iguana premiered on Broadway. This is a photograph from the most recent Broadway revival starring Cherry Jones. This was his last critical and commercial success during his lifetime. After 1961, with Night of the Iguana, Tennessee Williams wanted to experiment with new forms, new styles. And his work had never been tame. <laughs> Think about it. His early plays, con it contained forbidden desire, madness, castration, rape, cannibalism, and all forms of emotional and physical violence. Yet, the relative innocence and the outright censorship of the 40s and 50s were just able to keep these themes barely under control. The playfully dark humor of Williams' later plays are a logical and mature continuation of what he had been doing his whole career. In these later plays, as they're called, everything post-1961, Night of the Iguana, is considered the late plays of Tennessee Williams. They are extremely excessive, grotesque, campy, cartoonish. They've been uh, called pop art, burlesque, slapstick, grand guignol. Tennessee Williams is looking for new forms to express what he's trying to say as a playwright. In 1972, he commented on the change in his work since the 60s. Listen to this. I think that I'm growing into a, a more direct form, one that fits people and societies going a bit mad, you know? I'm very interested in the presentational form of theater, where everything is free and different, where you have total license. A good example of this is 1963's The Milk Train Doesn't Stop Here Anymore. It only ran for 69 performances. This is the latest off-Broadway production starring Olympia Dukakis. The, the play spans the final two days in the life of Fl uh, Flora Goforth, who is a wealthy widow living on uh, a cliff in the Divina Costiera in Italy. And this guy, Christopher Flanders, the angel of death, as he's called, comes to visit her. The plot parallels that of classic no plays, and it uh, features these two attendants who comment on the action. This is the, from the prologue. They say, about halfway down the page, we are also a device, a theatrical device of ancient and oriental origin, with occidental variations, however. We are stage assistants. We move the screens that mask the interior, interior playing areas of the stage presentation. We fetch and carry furniture and props to make the presentation, the play, or mask, or pageant move more gracefully, quickly, through the course of the two final days of Mrs. Goforth's existence. Richard Gilman, in his review of this production, said, Oh, and the title of the review is, Mr. Williams, He Dead. <laughs> Listen to this. This is mild. This is mild compared to how the critics treated Williams in his later years. Why, rather than be banal and hysterical and absurd, doesn't he keep quiet? Why doesn't he simply stop writing, stay absolutely unproductive for a long time in Key West or the south of Spain or the corner of any bar and just think? We know this is what he's been trying to do, but how is it possible in the midst of that self-created din, the clatter of the somersaults he keeps turning in front of us, like a spoiled child who needs to have his existence continually justified, indeed ascertained by our glances, which show admiration, fear, disgust, and troubled love. Many of Williams' friends and colleagues, and certainly I think that the critics killed him, in many ways. He wanted to try new things, and they kept saying, write another glass menagerie, write another streetcar, write another cat on a hot tin roof, but he didn't want to. He wanted to try new things, and it's, isn't it sad that it's only within the last 10 to 15 years that critics, scholars, directors, and actors are discovering these late plays. In 63, Frank Merlot, his longtime companion and lover, died, and Williams plunged into a deep depression. <coughs> He called the 60s his stoned age. He became an alcoholic. He became dependent upon pills. In 1966, the Gnoticus Fraulein premiered off-Broadway. This is one of my favorites. I directed this as a senior at Susquehanna. Uh, it's a one-act play that, together with another play called The Mutilated, comprises an evening he calls Slapstick Tragedy. 
It combines elements of circus, music hall, puppet show, and pantomime. In 1967, a, a essential play in the Williams canon, the two-character play, later called Outcry, premiered at London's Hampstead Theatre. It's about two brothers, Felice and Claire, two actors who are trapped in this theater and forced to uh, rehearse for this play. All right, the rest of their company hasn't shown up. They're locked in from the outside, and they go through this play. So it's, it's the play within the play structure that really is perhaps one of Williams's most extreme depictions of confinement, which means for him, in addition to physical constraint, being trapped by his past successes, fear of being trapped inside of a, a role, a fixed identity that people had fashioned for him. In 1970, he said, I, uh, I think the two-character play is my best play since Cat, maybe better. If I live, it'll be my best play, but that doesn't mean it will run more than three weeks. In 1969, in the bar of a Tokyo hotel premiered off-Broadway. And the reason that I included this is because it gives you an idea of how Williams' new style is exploring the emptiness of speech. If you're not familiar with his work, even from the excerpt I played from that opening speech of the Glass Menagerie, you can hear how lyrical and poetic his language is. With these later plays, he's abandoning that. Here's an example from the script. I mean, you can just see. Something has, what mark, affected my, affected your vision. Our breathing and the, the pulsation of our, our arteries are things that we are so used to that we usually don't think about them, but... In 1969, Williams was admitted to Barnes Hospital in St. Louis by his brother Dakin for alcohol and drug detoxification. In 1970, his controversial memoirs were released. In 1977, View Carré premiered on Broadway. I include this, again, because it's one of my favorites. I directed it at MU. But also, it's in many ways a return to his earlier style. There's really a trilogy, autobiographical trilogy, consisting of The Glass Menagerie, is when he is in St. Louis. View Carré, his first sojourn in New Orleans. Notice on the front of the script is 722 Rue Toulouse, where he stayed in his first visit to the city. And then the third one would be Something Cloudy, Something Clear, about his first summer in Provincetown, when he met a Canadian dancer named Kip Kiernan. In 1980, Williams' last play to premiere on Broadway during his lifetime opened, which was Clothes for a Summer Hotel. And then in 1983, he died by choking on the cap of a medicine bottle in the Hotel Elise in New York City. His brother, Dakin, up until the day he died, is convinced that Williams was murdered. What may have happened is that when he would take his pills every day, he would open them with his mouth. So it's possible that he swallowed the cap and asphyxiated. At least that's what the coroner's report says. In his will, Williams stipulated that his body be sewed up in a plain white sack and dumped at sea close to where Hart Crane drowned. Hart Crane was his favorite poet. After his death, Maria St. Just and his brother Dakin went against his wishes and had him buried in St. Louis, which incidentally he called the city of St. Pollution, a place that he hated. He's buried in Calvary Cemetery. Oh, some pictures of you, Carey, from my production. We'll just sit through those. This is from one of my visits to the cemetery. On the one side, Thomas Lanier Williams, 26th of March, 1911, the 25th of February, 1983. And then on the other side, it says, Tennessee Williams, poet, playwright, and I know you can't read the inscription, but it's a line from his play, Camino Real. The violets in the mountains have broken the rocks. Next to Williams is his sister, Rose. And the inscription on her tombstone says, blow out your candles, Laura a line from The Glass Menagerie and Tom's final speech. I don't have a photograph of it, but their mother, Edwina, is buried nearby. Okay, so I think I have about nine minutes left. <laughs> what questions do you have about Williams, his life, his career, his connection to Missouri, Columbia? write about his Columbia years because they were the most normal? Do I think he didn't write about them? Oh, I, that's a good question. I don't know. Um, 
Because it seems like he's documented other parts of oh, yeah. his life, you know, through, through the autobiography, through, you know, streetcars, obviously, his time in New Orleans and yeah. what he'd seen and taking that from his family. Yeah. So it seems strange that, you know, the, the way you described it, it with his Columbia years being the most normal, that that's almost, it's almost like he had to write about the abnormal, not about the normal. Yeah. I, I think done. that, um, I, I would agree with you. Um, also, one other thing that, um, although he could have returned to those Columbia years later in his life, I really see much of his, his, his uh, playwriting especially as him wrestling with these, these demons. Um, I mean, not always. I mean, there are some wildly outrageous and hilarious lighter plays, um, but like I mentioned earlier, I think it was a way for him. He was terrified of going insane like his sister Rose. And no matter where he was in the world, no matter what state he was in, what he had done or who he was with the night before, he got up every single morning and wrote. Whether it was just a single line or a couple, you know, whatever on the page, he would sit down and write. And that was a way of him creating meaning in his life. So I had never thought about it in those terms, but that's certainly possible that there was no need to write in dramatic form about that particular period in his life. That's interesting. Well, they could have been the most boring, too. You have to look at that. Yeah, he, he was there for three years, yeah, yeah. and not a very good student. Um, and he was, there, there are some funny passages in his letters and in his notebook about his time in the ATO house. <laughs> but that's about as exciting as it gets. Yeah. Uh, do you know much about his relationship with Kazan? Yeah. Um, there are, uh, Aliyah Kazan, I don't know if you know who he was, is, was, um, was a frequent collaborator of Tennessee Williams. There's a great book by Brenda Murphy about their collaboration. And especially with uh, Streetcar and Cat, some people think that those plays wouldn't be what they are without Kazan. There's a great story about Cat on a Hot Tin Roof in particular, that Williams had written the play in three acts with the ending that he wanted, but he desperately wanted another commercial success at that time after the failure of Camino Real. He had had a string of flops, right? And Kazan suggested an alternate ending, a different version of act three, which, much to his chagrin, Williams eventually plugged in because he wanted that commercial success. And it wasn't until um, uh, uh, Michael Kahn and, uh, directed the Broadway revival with Elizabeth Ashley and Fred Gwynn that they reinstated Williams' original uh, third act. They're both, he, he published both of them, which caused a rift in his friendship with Kazan. Um, but... There's a lot of scholarship about would these plays be what they are without Aliyah Kazan. I think they would be different, certainly. He was very, very proactive in, in helping William shape the text. Yeah. You, you mentioned Elizabeth Ashley there. Um, I know, how did Williams feel about the production? How involved was he with the productions of his plays? Because I know, for instance, he, Elizabeth Ashley he thought so highly. Oh, yeah. Um, we had her uh, at MU back in March. And, yeah. Yeah. And she's since become a friend, and I've talked to her uh, quite a bit about their relationship. And he loved actors. If he was available, he was at rehearsal. Not to the point of interfering with what the director was doing, but he was there. Um, working with them, and in fact, when he showed up for the first rehearsals of that Broadway revival of Cat on a Hot Tin Roof, he came, she tells this great story, with all these just bags, um, and he came to the table and introduced himself to everyone, and just started emptying the bags, and on pieces of paper and notebooks and like tissue boxes that he had torn up, he had different lines and different versions of scenes, and he would just pass them out to the actors and say, read that for me, you read that for me. And he wanted to see how, you know, whether it worked in their voice, you know, and what they thought of it. Some people think that he was too collaborative with directors and actors, um, that, you know, to the point of allowing them to, you know, turn his work into something very different. Yeah. How did he like the, um, 
movie versions of his plays. Because I mean, earlier you talked about how he was so interested in this plastic theater, yeah. the idea that the theater could do more than a film, but yeah. yet I think more people, I mean, I guess not more non-theater people are familiar with Absolutely. the film versions of you know, his, yeah. his plays than they are with actually having seen the play itself. I think he liked the money that they brought him, <laughs> first and foremost. He hated Cat. Uh, I'll talk about that a little bit on Wednesday the, night. The Elizabeth Taylor one? Mm -hmm. Interesting. Yeah. Um, he, he liked Streetcar. He liked what Kazan had do with, did with that. And of course you had the original Broadway company with the exception of Jessica Tandy who was replaced by Vivian Lee. Right? Um, he really liked Baby Doll. Um, but it, it is a very different medium. And oh, hated the, the version of the Glass Menagerie with the new ending, the happy ending, where you see this string of gentlemen callers waiting up to, or, or lining up to meet Laura. <laughs> yeah. I'll talk about that a little more on, on Wednesday night, how uh, letters that he had written about these individual movies. Years ago, I saw him on stage and saw a crap warnings that he actually took a role in that. Yeah, he played Why? Doc. Uh, why do you think you would want to do that? You should get the real experience of us. Because, actor, yeah, I've actually directed Confessional, which is a shorter version, earlier version of Small Craft Warnings, mm -hmm. and it was sagging at the box office. Williams loved the play, and he wanted it to be a success. So he thought maybe by stepping into the role of Doc, it would boost ticket sales, and it did. Yeah, although he freely admitted, I'm not an actor. <laughs> But uh, there, it's interesting, if, if you read the play, there are so many similarities between Williams and, and that character. Yeah. Uh, we have like two, two minutes left, maybe one more question, if you have any more. What was your favorite Tennessee Williams play and why? It's like choosing your favorite child. <laughs> um, I don't know. Um, I love... I've primarily directed and studied, well, I primarily directed the late plays uh, because I want them to help, I want to, this might sound egotistical and I don't mean it to be, I want to help them find an audience for people to see this work that they wouldn't otherwise see. You can see Menagerie, Streetcar, Cat, Summer and Smoke, the big ones, pretty much anywhere, right? But, such as Fayette. Right, such as Fayette. Right, yeah. But it, those, those later plays, I think, are some of them are so good. One of my favorites is Clothes for a Summer Hotel, 1980, his last play to come to Broadway during his lifetime. It's all about F. Scott Fitzgerald and his wife, Zelda. Fascinating. It's a ghost play, and I'd really like to direct that, except the cast is huge. <laughs> I love Kamino Real too, that phantasmagoric just flight of fantasy in which all these literary characters are gathering at the kind of the end of their road. Really interesting play. Um, and New Directions, I, I'm not at all affiliated with them, but they are reissuing Williams's plays in single editions with introductions by contemporary playwrights. And the one I would recommend most highly is they just published The Glass Menagerie with a 40-some page introduction by Tony Kushner. And it's just brilliant, as you expect it to be, coming from Kushner. And John Guare actually wrote the introduction for the version of, of Camino Real. Camino Real and Clothes for a Summer Hotel. Two of the lesser known Williams plays that I really, really like. Uh, I just have another question. I have a friend who thinks that Tennessee Williams is no longer uh, a playwright, or his plays do not connect with today's youth, uh, which I don't agree with. I don't either. Uh, and uh, so I'm just wondering why you think people would still connect with it today. I, the themes that he deals with, um, first and foremost, uh, that I mentioned earlier, but also the opportunity I, I think about it from a directing or an acting standpoint, the opportunity to explore these complex characters, you would be hard pressed to find characters in dramatic literature more vibrant and interesting and complex than those in Williams's canon. But as far as audiences, I think these themes that he's dealing with, entrapment, escape, all sexuality which runs throughout his work, um, is, is still, you know, still concerns us. And the, some of the later stuff, um, 
you know, he was not really a political playwright, whatever that means, not overtly political, but a couple of his later works, like Red Devil Battery Sign, uh, talking about um, uh, a more explicit exploration of, of politics, but the lyricism of his language, I mean, I just don't, I don't know, I'm too, maybe I'm too close to it to really comment or to answer that question, um, but I don't see how someone can't be <laughs> attracted to and interested in Williams, especially, you know, for all of us here in Missouri, the local connection, right? Grew up in St. Louis, attended the University of Missouri, writes about Missouri, St. Louis, Columbia. Yeah. I, I know that didn't at all answer your question, but I'll have to think about that. I mean, I, I, we took a group of students to see the Glass Menagerie at KC Rep a couple of years ago. Directed by David Cromer. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. And followed all of the original um, uh, stage directions that yep. the legends put up. Yep. And uh, just fantastic. They also used a, a cameras, live cameras yeah. during the production. Yep. Uh, which. Uh, I, well, I don't, I don't necessarily think it, it, that you have to do that yeah. you know, to capture it, but uh, it definitely disproved my friend's point because yeah. uh, my students were in tears in that yeah. direction. It was really fantastic. And a play like the Gnoticus Fraulein is like an SNL skit on acid. <laughs> really. I mean, it's just crazy. You, you, should, you should check it out with the, the circus and the clowning, and it's just ridiculous. Um, yeah. Anyway, thank you all very much.